Very quickly, um, we're delighted as DGB to have tied in with, um, with Fever Tree. Why? Uh, because the international success of this brand has been phenomenal. And I don't want to steal Tim's thunder, but I'll quickly tell you a little bit of background to what is an amazing story. And an obvious gap that, that sat in the market that no one really uh, woke up to until uh, Tim and his partner got into it. But, I had a great friend of mine, Richard Turner, he ran Ala de Mec. And I'll never forget Richard saying to me, you know Tim, we've got two gins. We have the, we have the beef eater, it's the only gin produced in the borough of London. And then we've got another gin, it's a shitty little town called Plymouth. So we're going to mark all Plymouth and we're focusing on beef eating. Anyway, Tim's partner was the, the young buck who said, oh, let's buy Plymouth gin. And he repackaged it, refurbed it made it very funky and cool, the, the naval history around Plymouth. And uh, to cut a long story short, he sold it for a telephone figure uh, a number of years later to um, Absolute, a system logger of Sweden. Uh, so he had a lot of money, and Tim thought he was maybe quite a good guy to know. And they were sitting down talking about just business opportunities, because they went to the same school together, but I won't mention the school because I don't want to embarrass them. Um, <laughs> But anyway, they said, you know, it's amazing. The quality of gyms are exploding. People are looking at new botanicals. Uh, the price points are, are going through the roof. And there is this massive gym boom underway. 
But the obvious was the three quarters of a gin and tonic is your mixer. And mixers have been the forgotten child. You order gin and a tonic. No one ever asked you what tonic you wanted, you had a tonic. We won't name the tonic it was, but it is a well known Spran. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, they, they obviously, and then Tim will tell you the whole story, but it's, it's what is, I find phenomenal. I mean, I, we do a lot of business in the States as DGB. I mean, they've only really just got into the States in their own operation. But I mean, I've just been in the Carolinas, in a redneck country where Mr. Trump's quite popular. And every bar I went to has got fever tree. It's, it's phenomenal. So I see South Africa being no different. Um, we're very excited about this gin explosion. Uh, it's amazing and it's great to have our gin partners here. So with no further ado, over to Tim. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. He did say keep the speech short, so it's been very helpful by reducing half of what I was going to tell you. Um, but look, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it couldn't be a better time to be visiting South Africa. I've just left uh, England, the, the winter in England, and of course arriving on the back of a big England rugby win. So, oh, uh, which I did say I wouldn't have mentioned, but I can't resist. Um, but look, um, just I, I will flick here to uh, to this is uh, Charles, who who Tim just mentioned, my business partner, uh, and Tim is. Pretty much right. Um, we, I called him up actually out of the blue because of the success Charles had had with, with Plymouth Gin uh, to talk to him about gin. I was looking at various opportunities in and around the premium spirits industry and drinks in general. And actually our conversation over our first cup of coffee changed from gin to tonic for the very reason that Tim illustrated. We both realized with different experiences uh, this extraordinary imbalance uh, and, you know, there was this revolution going on in the world of premium spirits. And yet, no one had stopped to think about the mixer. So, you know, our view was it was worth a crack. Uh, as Tim Riley pointed out, Charles had already made a bit of money. I hadn't. I had nothing more than student loans. So the 18 months uh, that it took to develop our first tonic was a very painfully impoverished one. Um, and, and really the reason it took us so long is that you know we wanted to put quality back uh, into this mixer category in really all forms. You know, we wanted to, we started with the packaging looking at, you know, we wanted to put it in glass in single serve bottles to keep the freshness, to keep the carbonation. You know, we looked at the imagery, the serve, you know, no one really stopped to think about the serve of gin and tonic. You know, so we put it right at the beginning in this big balloon glass, you know, to be appreciated like you appreciate great wine. But nowhere did we put uh, quality back uh, as we did in the actual ingredients you know, in the product. Um, and so, you know, the journey started by going into the library uh, and researching the history of tonic and its ingredients. And then physically, uh, you know, Charles and I went out around the world to go and find uh, and that's taken us to some pretty weird places. Uh, this is a picture of Charles sweating away uh, in the deepest Ivory Coast, where we found this wonderful sort of fresh green ginger uh, for our ginger ales. Uh, it's taken us to some, some, some more wonderful places. Actually, this was me uh, earlier this year out in uh, Yucatan province in Mexico, uh, where we were hunting down this sort of rare citrus. Uh, that we'd heard and read about there. Um, but it's also taken us to, uh, me in particular actually, uh, to some dangerous places. Uh, none, in my case, more memorable than a, a trip that I took very early on uh, to go and find Quinny. Um, and this took me to the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, as I'm sure most of you in this room know, but um, you know, Quinny is the very essence of tonic water. You know, the whole reason tonic water came about uh, was quinine is, at the time, the only thing that could prevent you from catching malaria. So it was actually the British troops uh, back in 1820 who gave a dose of quinine uh, to, to their troops to prevent them from catching the disease. Now, if, if you've made the mistake that I have, which is trying quinine in its rawest form, so it comes from uh, the bark of the fever tree, 
and this is uh, me rather inexplicably knocking the bark off, which is where the quinine comes from. Quinine is incredibly bitter, so understandably, you know, they mixed uh, their quinine with water, with sugar, with the natural fruits around anything to help the medicine go down. Um, and then the one thing the British always uh, had were armed with at that point was a ration of gin. So to really help the medicine go down with the permission to their officers, they added gin to their tonic. And that is, of course, how, how the drink uh, started. But um, my research in the British Library, I found that the last remaining plantation of the highest quality quinine uh, was unfortunately just about the most remote place with the eastern part of the Congo, in a place called Bukavu. Uh, and you'll be much more familiar with it than I was at the time when it set out to go there, but just to get there, I had to fly to Nairobi, Nairobi to Kigali and Rwanda with a local taxi driver, drive across Rwanda, um, which I have to say was, it was a beautiful, it was a wonderful experience right up until I, I hit the border uh, at the Congo, which was absolute chaos. And you know, the reason I put this picture up there, because everyone was saying to me, ah, oh, it's beautiful, you know, famous for its gorillas. Well, sadly, the only gorillas I came across uh, were, were, was this type. Um, and and in just in the three miles, rather sadly actually, that it took from the border uh, to get to, to the uh, first plantation, I was stopped in you know, three different roadblocks. You know, the, the first one was a plank of wood with six inch nails thrown out in front of the car, um, which was a very effective way of getting you stopped, particularly the guy was so heavily armed.